I did want to, one short memory I want to share with you guys. In the last few years, my siblings and I uh, started having conference calls with my dad. And it was a really cool way for us to keep in touch and share stories of each other's lives. Every few months, we'd put a call together. And my dad would get on. It would essentially turn into my dad just, just cracking all of us up for an hour on the telephone. And, um, and some, one call in particular, I remember uh, the, the topic of, of maybe some of our youthful indiscretions uh, came up, uh, of us kids. And, and my dad listened to some stories and, of course, chimed in with his thoughts on some of these events in the past. And he said, you know, your mother and I only had two rules for you kids. One, you can never ride a motorcycle, and two, you have to go to college. And I think we should have had some more rules. <laughs> so, and he waited a beat, just like all great comedians do. Uh, he waited, and he, I think we should have had some more rules. Uh, so with that, I will open it up to anyone uh, here who would like to, and it does involve actually coming up and using the microphone. Uh, does anyone have a story, a memory, a thought about my dad? Yeah. Sure. And remember to say who you are. And... <coughs> what if I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Eric Crawford, and I'm a neighbor here at Piper's Landing. And uh, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, Jack and Ethel and how well I know them, having been in their house several times, many times. And a couple times they were home. <laughs> That's one good way to get to know them very quickly. Jack was, you never knew how old Jack was because he was the youngest, best looking guy in Piper's Landing. We never had a Mr. Piper's Landing contest because he would have won it hands down. And, and he would have naturally accepted it too. Jack had such a great sense of humor that even when he was the object of fun, he had a great time. Only about two weeks ago, I was driving my golf cart past his house, and he was outside getting the mail out of the mailbox. And I slowed down, and he said, hi, Eric. And I ignored him, and I yelled into the house. I said, Ethel, Jack got out again. <laughs> and with that, he, he, he roared. <laughs> Anyone else would have thrown the mail at me. <laughs> Those of us who are a little bit younger would tend to look at Jack as sort of the father figure here at Piper's Landing, but he wasn't. He was just one of us. He was a regular guy. He would do anything that uh, anybody else would. So that's why I know that Jack would understand why I wanted to go first today. I got a 115 tea time. <laughs> Good tone for the lunch. Um, anybody, really, don't be shy. I don't think this is a shy group, uh, from my experience. So, anybody who wants to. Cindy, would you like to come up? Oh, Ed. No? Cindy, really, don't. Take advantage of the open bar. This is my sister, Cindy. So first of all, I'm supposed to ask who brought chicken soup to Ethel's because they didn't leave their name. If, if you did, please let Ethel know. Um, I'm Cindy. I'm, I'm Jack's daughter. I live in Montana. I'm a children's librarian. So I wanted to talk about my dad with kids. <laughs> my brother mentioned how he was rather childlike, but he was magical with children. So I'm going to start with... When we were children, if I can, <laughs> um, so Christmas was amazing in our house. And it was something that was like an orchestrated affair that was the most incredible morning of our lives and we'll never forget. So, so my dad used to work for a folding door company, so we have these doors that you never ever see them anymore, but they were these like sort of folding doors and, and they shut off the living room and so we would all get up and um, be so excited we could hardly stand it and he would the doors would be shut and he would walk into he would say I have to check on everything just a moment and we'd all be standing there in our pajamas and he would um, 
you know, go in and shut the door, and he'd turn on the lights and turn on the Christmas tree, and he'd check to make sure Santa had left something. And then he would come back out and open the door for us. And oh my goodness, it was just the most amazing thing ever. And I think as grown children, you know, as, as the parents now of children, we tried really hard to make that happen for our kids. And we never quite were able to, to do it the way my dad did it. So anyway, that, that was, he, he made things really magical for us as children. And that was, oh my gosh, what, what more could you ask for? And then the other thing is, I think we have these memories of um, going to the Ohio State Fair with my dad. My mother never went to the Ohio State Fair. <laughs> she hated that. And um, so we would go with my dad, and he would never ride on the ride with us. He just would stand there waiting for us at the little exit. So we would go on these rides that were always a little bit of scary to us. And so we, we'd be on them and we'd, you know, we'd be a little nervous and we'd look and there would be that white head, you know, standing there waiting for us. And I just remember the feeling of, of getting off and like looking around and finding like the most handsome, wonderful man was there waiting for us. He was our dad. And, um, and I just remember walking through the fair and he'd hold our hands and, you know, my dad had a really strong grip. We all sort of have inherited that. And he just hold our hand, and he gave us such a feeling of trust and security. And he, he actually did that our entire life. And so how lucky are we? Because we know that for children to really thrive in this world, they need security and trust and love their entire life. And boy, he did that from the very beginning of our lives until he still does. He still does that. So, and then, and then he had grandchildren. And oh my gosh, boy did he love his grandchildren. You know, from from when they were born. So my dad had these lovely broad shoulders, and he, um, you know, he just took a baby and put them on his shoulder, and they were they were sad. Uh, Michael. And we've been, we have, we all come from big families. Um, I'm one of ten. Jack was one of seven. And you've always felt particularly close to Jack's family. And it happens in these big families. You just have cousins that you hit it off with. And, and I know they, they've always been close to us. My dad, I know this will come as a shock to everyone who knows him, has written a poem for me. <laughs> so I would like you to read the poem, which I'll do for you now. For my beloved brother Jack, Jack as a youngster and as a teenager was one cool, graceful, sophisticated guy. He did it all with what his friends and ancestors would call panache. When Jack was 10, we put him on a train to Detroit by himself and told him to wave at a crossing where we would wait for him. We were standing at the crossing to greet him when the train went by. He gave us a wave and immediately turned to look forward. Although I was three years older, Although I was three years older, I grew up seeing Jack as my hero. He, was a, he always knew what was going on. If I had known it sooner, I would have asked him, but I certainly did not know. I had some of his cool by the time I was 40, but he had it at the age of 10. <laughs> Jack did well in school, in football, in World War II, in the Navy. He did well in combat. When I was awkward with girls, Jack was as suave as Cary Grant. When my son Paul died, Jack was with me at the wake and the funeral, supporting me in my grief. He kept his cool and, until at the funeral home. Six young boys came up to me with worn t-shirts and holes in their trousers. They handed me a dirty envelope with $14.17 in coins they collected, telling me it was in, in honor of my son, whom they admired. When I broke up, Jack had already gone in the bathroom, and the only time he lost his cool. Jack's death is a loss of a good man and a great man, both in short supply today. Jesus, accept Jack, forgive him all his sins, and now that he has finished his race, please hold him tight in your embrace forever, into eternity. Amen. Um, 
there have been a few couples here that have had the fortune of traveling. Ethel and Jack, Arnold and uh, Helen Horowitz. I'm kind of losing my brain right now. Um, Sylvia and Ralph Evans, and Al and I. And our first big trip was to Sorrento for two weeks. So we used Sorrento as our base for hopping along the Amalfi Coast. Well, the first story is really on Ethel, because <clears throat> Sorrento is a very old city, little windy streets, and it's all kinds of vendors and things and samples, samples of gelato, samples of limoncello. This is the headquarters of the world, limoncello. In fact, I have a couple of Jack's bottles of limoncello in my freezer still, Ethel. So Ethel would go off by herself, and after about the third or fourth day, one vendor kicked her out of his limoncello store because she had been in it too many times and he didn't let her come in again. Right? So the first night, eight of us are sitting for dinner, and Jack says to the waiter, Do you have a wine list? And he brings the wine list. And so he goes down to prices as an accountant would do and talks about this and talks about that. Then he says to the waiter, do you have house wine? He says, yes. Well, how much is it? Of course. And it was like $5. Yeah. So he said, well, who's drinking red? Who's drinking white? All right, we have one red and one white. And about 15 minutes later, he says to the white waiter, we need another red. And then... 25, 30 minutes later, we need another red and we need another white. So the next night we go out for dinner, he asks for the wine list. What is your house wine? It's $5. It's cheap. We want two reds and two whites. A little while goes on. We'll have one more red. Then the next night we go out to a different restaurant. He asks for the wine list, and she says, "What is the house wine?" And the guy tells him, "You have know, six bucks or so." And he said, "We'll have three reds and two whites." So here's to Jack: three reds and two whites. Mr. Tracy was still living at home at the time. I remember sitting there, looking at my mom, looking at my sister, and then my dad walks in, and thinking. I hit the dad lottery over here. I mean, this guy's my dad. I mean, he's like the coolest guy. You know, I'm like, he just was like, I just couldn't believe every time. I just, I remember him ha turning 50 and having a birth, having a birthday dinner at Steak and Ale or Joshua Tree in Mount Lebanon, and, and just walking and walking from work and thinking, that is my dad. Like, he's always my dad. He always will be my dad. And I, I just couldn't believe my good fortune. So, um, it's a quick memory for me. Um, I do have a Bruce Springsteen related dad story. It's like I work Bruce Springsteen into everything. Um, when I saw Bruce Springsteen for the first time with my sister Kathy in 1980, I was so enthralled with what I saw. It was such a great show. I was 15 years old. Of course, my dad and mom, being the people they were, they were like, is there some way we can take you to see another show on this tour? We can figure out a way. And I said, well, he's not coming back to Pittsburgh. And they were like, well, is he playing anywhere close? Because I had like the greatest parents. And they're like, I'm like, yeah, he's playing in Cleveland in the summer. And they mailed away and got me tickets. You'll see it in, in Cleveland. But they got four tickets, and my siblings all couldn't go. So my friend Dan and I went with my mom and dad to Cleveland, Ohio. And, they, and they, we, we had two extra tickets. So there's my dad in his three-piece suit, fresh from his day at Rockwell International, trying to scout tickets for Bruce Springsteen. And let me just say some colorful characters were attending the concert, and they were like, wait, I'm sorry, you're selling tickets? You're this distinguished-looking businessman? And of course, my dad, he sold them for face value, and he was like, how good is this guy? All I got was face value. Yeah. <laughs> tickets were $11. Yeah. Yeah. said, uh, you know, it would have been perfect for one thing. Michigan didn't win. <laughs> I just wanted to make a few comments. You're all read the obituary. It was wonderful. And he talked about, it, the obituary it talks about three charities. <laughs> I knew about the library. Jack, as Patty just referred to it, 
I spent many years on the library board, the library foundation board. He spearheaded a particular program, the literacy program, and fortunately or unfortunately, we turned it over last Thursday, back at the board meeting, to the county. But it was a tremendous program. There is serious literacy, illiteracy in Martin County. We think of ourselves as an affluent county. We are affluent, but we are poor where it comes to literacy. Particularly as you go out to Indian Pond, you know you would expect it, but it's more prevalent than that. And then you know about his interest in the lyric theater. I know John is here somewhere. Well, Jack and Ethel revitalized our lyric theater. When I came here, it was closed. And it wasn't much more than that after I'd been here a long time. <laughs> came Jack and uh, Bethel, and the first thing you know, it starts to come to life. And John Lester joins the group. I may have the timing not quite perfect, but as you all know, the lyric is a living, thriving theater today. We all benefit from it, and I think we owe that to Jack. And of course to the Ethel. She was wonderful. And then to dig a little further, there comes up this name Tykes and Teens. And I looked at that and I said, Toys for Tots. It's not Toys for Tots, it's Tykes for Teens. Well, I don't know how many of you know about Tykes for Teens. I'd be ignorant. So last night I did what I always do. I went, I, I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> it's something we ought to all be interested in. This is a homegrown toy. I want to just raise a toast uh, to my dad. Uh, Lake was right. Everyone did love him. I'm so happy to be with all of you today, with Ethel and the family and all of his friends. Um, and just raise a glass to my dad. Uh, everybody did love him. Thank you.